Thanks for that kind introduction, Paolo. So, so good afternoon. Ah, what? I can't help but ask the question. Yes. The title. I, Are you on the DC comic side or the Marvel comic side? The DC, I'm on the, you know, I don't know. You know. <laughs> yeah, this is Big Bang Theory now, right? <laughs> No, I mean Big Bang Theory, you know, the, 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 the comic book kings, Big Bang Theory, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't read comic books. I am sh perhaps I am failed in my nerd status there. But, uh, but I, I think Marvel, I would say. Uh, maybe Marvel I prefer slightly. But, uh, I don't feel very superhero. Well, I've got more. I've got more. Okay, so I think I'll stand over there because it's a bit, uh, I feel a bit crowded. So, as I say, good before that question, that very early question. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to tell you about the mo modal, which is the seventh, the magnificent seventh, as they described it in the CERN Courier. Well, I wrote the article, so <laughs> that's why it's called that. Uh, and that's, that was approved in March 2010. It doesn't actually get to run yet till the after the long shutdown. Then we'll start up at 14 TV, then we'll run. But we've got lots of test detectors in, so we'll have, uh, we'll have results before that. Okay, so uh, let's get on. So I give you the menu for the talk today. We we'll start with a little history because monopoles are not you pe people don't talk much about monopoles these days. We we'll talk about Dirac's monopole, Toft's monopole, and maybe a little bit about searching for cosmic monopoles. I'm going to show you some tantalizing results that uh, indicate there could be monopoles. So we might have detected them already, but it's up to you to believe or disbelieve those tantalizing results. And then, of course, we'll get to the modal experiment and we'll come to conclusions. And, of course, not only do we call our experiment metal, which is not actually for the reason that you think, but anyway, it, uh, we also have uh, uh, champagne ready. Uh, this Heidsack Mo and Co. monopole champagne is all ready and waiting for when we discover something. So the story, uh, this is going to be unusual. I don't think many people go back to 1269. Uh, to begin a, a talk. So the, idea, the, the discovery of the, of the North Pole, or the, should we say the idea of poles, goes all the way back uh, to 1269 with a guy called Petrus Peregrinus. That's his Latin name. His name, French name was Pierre de Maricourt, who in 1269 was part of the siege army uh, in Lucera in Italy. Now, Petrus Peregrinus was a French Franciscan monk a mercenary soldier and a scholar. So I think he could really make a great candidate for president, actually. I think he's got all those <laughs> contradictory things. And he, during this, uh, during this siege, you'd think he'd be rather worried about getting, his, uh, getting in trouble with a stray arrow or something, but he actually wrote uh, uh, one of the first documents that looks remotely like a modern scientific doc document called the Epistola di Magnet. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. And he did a lot of experimental, systematic experimental investigation of lodestones. And he said, in this stone, the lodestone, which is, of course, the uh, uh, primitive form of a magnet, you should thoroughly comprehend there are two points of which one is called the north, the, remain, the remaining one called the south. That was the first time a north and a south pole were recognized. So we can say that the magnetic, magnetic monopole could be the oldest. Uh, the search for the magnetic monopole must have gone on for the longest time because it you could say it started in 1269. We'll jump a long way forward, because we're not doing a history lecture here, to Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell. And of course, in 1873, mo all of us, as good physicists, know that he made the connection between electricity and magnetism. He came up with the Victorian Grand Unified Theory, the second Grand Unified Theory after Newton's unification of, of uh, celestial gravity and, yes, Okay, so magnetism, I'm very sorry, yeah, that's electricity, that's light, and that one I, that's, I can't see. <laughs> Must be a monopole. Must be a monopole, yeah. <laughs> so these are the, the four things that go into, and they're just basically e essences of electromagnetism, if you want. So, so they, uh, it says mechanical forces, but I'm, maybe mechanical forces, anyway, never mind. Forget about that. The idea is, this is an, an artist drawing anyway, the idea is that they unified electricity and magnetism into one, 
complete whole. And he did most of that work in a place called King's College, London. So I've written out here Maxwell's equations without monopoles, and we are all used to those equations, I think. And I've written the, mag the Maxwell's equations with magnetic monopoles. And you can see that with magnetic monopoles, there's a much greater symmetry. In fact, the, the presence of magnetic monopoles symmetrizes Maxwell's equations. In fact, Ma Ma Maxwell, of course, had not put in monop magnetic monopoles at all because he, did he, he knew there was no experimental evidence for them. Um, so that's how they got left out. Now, we all know, too, that if we divide a, an ordinary magnetic a magnet dipole into two and two and two and two that we don't make monopoles but the idea is like the electric charge can we have independent magnetic charge and as I said a magnetic charge will restore symmetry to Maxwell's equations and those symmet those symmetrized Maxwell's equations will be invariant under a rotation in the plane of the electric and magnetic field that symmetry is called duality and it essentially says there's no real distinction between electricity and magnetism in that event. So, shock horror, the form that we see the, the, the magnetic uh, Maxwell's four laws, they don't really come from Maxwell. He expressed them in a very complicated form. 20 equations with 20 variables using something called quaternions as a basic mathematics. The person that introduced uh, the kind of vector calculus and, the, and these famous four variables, a guy called Oliver Heaviside from the famous Heaviside layer. And uh, actually Heaviside used the concept of magnetons, which was his name for monopoles, to derive all his results. And what he did at the end of it, you would just put the magnetic charge to zero. But he used the concept of, mag of magnetons and actually described them in his, in his work. But it was Pierre Curie who was the first... Again, you can see this. When I put it up on the web, you'll be able to see this quite clearly. Uh, but what this is is uh, the first paper that actually takes seriously the idea that it could be free magnetic charge. So here, magnetique, magnetism, free. You can just see it there. And, of course, it was Dirac that, that first really took the idea to to the proper level for us to continue. And he, within the framework of quantum mechanics, saw the monopole as an infinitely long, infinitely thin string. Here we see it zooming off to infinity. And he said that if we could prove that this string couldn't be set, this end, of course, we all know, if this is a solenoid, this end will be the North Pole, right? You're just going to see it suddenly appear. There we are. But of course, this North Pole would be nice, but what about this string hanging off and, of course, the South Pole are infinitely far away? If we can prove this string doesn't exist by rotating an electron around the center of the string and then looking, to see, and looking for the conditions where this electron, the, the wave function of the electron would only acquire a trivial phase, in other words, wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to detect the, the string with this change in the wave function, then... That string can't be seen, and therefore, according to Dirac, it's not there. And if we look at those conditions, we can make, uh, we can derive a condition that relates this electric, ch the magnetic charge G, and the electric charge E, to some fundamental constants and a number. So what essentially he's done, and it's, this is just a rearrangement of this formula, is explain the quantization of electric charge. Because if, if a monopole exists, then this relation exists, and it relates G and E via some number, which is an integer. So he explained the quantization of electric charge, and of course, comes up with uh, uh, the idea that free charge, magnetic charge, could exist in the shape of this uh, monopole with a Dirac string that, however, cannot be detected, and therefore, in a sense, is not there. So anyway, I thought, and I like to introduce some irrelevant details here to, so everybody can relax a bit. So um, I, looked, I looked to see, well, James Clark Maxwell, Dirac, how famous are they, these people? I mean, I've heard of them, but how much do people know about them? So I found this BBC poll in 2002 where they looked at the top 100 greatest Brits, and I saw James Clark Maxwell um, 
nine, number 91, which is a bit low because he was t probably one of the top three physicists ever. But then, of course, I was even more shocked to find out that Johnny Rotten of the six <laughs> Sex Pistols was 87th. And, of course, poor old Paul Dirac doesn't even get there. That was always his problem. So I actually read uh, James Farmella's book about Dirac, The Strangest Man. It's a really good book to read. And I found out that Dirac here was at the same uh, primary school, that's, a, that's for very young children in England, as Cary Grant, who was called Archie Leach at the time. Of course, I, can just, I could just love to read a short story about these two guys having a conversation. Wouldn't it be fun? But actually, as Dirac was known for his not speaking it, there was a unit of, of silence called a Dirac, one Dirac in Cambridge when he went there. And, and he, uh, one Dirac is what was it, one word per hour. And I think he always was a, sl uh, he was a fraction of a Dirac at best. Anyway, those two. And of course, another thing that happened, it, it went on to another, just down the road to another uh, Merchant Ventures school, technical college in those days, which is just down the road in Bristol. And it turns out that Peter Higgs went to the same school as Dirac as well. So there's something odd about Bristol. Maybe this is water. But maybe we should go down and try and bottle the water. But of course, it looks like Peter Higgs has gotten some of this kind of theatrical. It's, uh, he seems to have acquired it. And he, he looks even a li bit, little bit like Hitchcock there. <laughs> anyway, carrying on. So now we move to Deuce, uh monopole. And the reason I want to show you this, this can't be really detected at the LHC, but uh, I wanted to show you this to let you know there are many forms of monopole. And this, Tooft and Polyakov found a, 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 a non-abelian grand unified gauge theory monopole. And in all these gauge theories, the monopoles are actually predicted. In fact, they, they arise in all modern theories, string theories, M theories, no, uh, most grand unified theories monopole solutions are there. Of course, where are they? Now, this, these monopoles are something weird. This is the grand unified monopole, or a gum. And this is called a topological soliton. And it has topological charge, which is equal to an, uh, the magnetic charge of a Dirac monopole, by the way. And really, the, the topology of the soliton's field configuration gives a stability. And you can think of a charge as a kind of uh, a charge monopole is kind of not in the field configuration. And of course, what's important for that knot to stop it unraveling, of course, are the boundary conditions. So that's what stops that knot from un unraveling. Now, this, this is a pretty amazing device. It's something like a Fermi across, and it weighs something like uh, not too diff different from a bacterium. So it's, it's really a pretty hefty device for an elementary party, a pretty, ele a pretty hefty particle for an elementary uh, for an elementary particle, and in, in, its, in its tiny little heart, it has a replica of the Big Bang, essentially. So it's an amazing, amazing piece of uh, physics, I think. And of course, some people say, well, what are solitons? I mean, perhaps some, some experimentalists, I'm sure all theoreticians know this, but the solitons, what are they? Well, they're, of course, we know they're these things that they have, they're stable field configurations, but is there anything like it in our everyday world? And there is. And I think the first soliton was seen by a guy called John Russell in 1834. And he was inspecting the Union Canal near Edinburgh. And he saw, uh, and this is exactly the same Union Canal. I mean, I don't think this concrete is the Victorian concrete. It's been done up a bit, but the same width, same canal. And he saw a barge push into this bridge. And he saw it push ahead of it. Uh, a wave of water. And, this, and John Russell followed this wave for miles and miles and miles and miles until he got bored and he wrote, he wrote about it. And this is a soliton, a solitary wave. And the thing that keeps it stable and moving, of course, are the boundary conditions, which in this case are the, the borders of the uh, canal, the banks of the canal. They provide the boundary conditions, those two brick, brick walls that I showed you on the previous slide. And here we see, a little bit closer to home, two solitons crossing each other in the waves off the coast of Oregon. This is in shallow water where I guess the boundary condition is just the, the, the bed of the seabed. So here, by the way, is Tooft. Tooft. Uh, and this is what happens when you let theoreticians try and come up with experiments. They're trying to make a magnetic monopole by pulling apart that. Oh, I, I, 
I'm only joking. But that's, that's two there. So what are the, the properties of the magnetic monopole? They've got some, it's got some pretty amazing properties. First, when you calculate its charge, it's, it's effectively 68 and a half times the electric charge. So if it's, if it's moving with very high velocity, if it's relativistic, the square of that charge will give its ionizing power. So it's 4,700 times more ionizing than uh, an electron. And of course, it can be, it doesn't have to be a unit magnetic charge. In fact, it could be nine. Uh, it could be uh, s much more. This n could be one, two, three, or four. In fact, if the fundamental charge isn't E, but say 130, because that's the charge of a quark, then this would be nine times 68 and a half, which could explain why it isn't seen in some detectors, because it gets absorbed so quickly into the detector. Coupling constants huge, 34, so that makes that means perturbative calculations are very, very difficult. The energy acquired in a magnetic field is kind of fun too. Uh, it's 2.06 it's 2 MeV per Gauss meter. So in 2T, uh, we, if I just take an ordinary 10 Tesla, 10 meter long LHC magnet, I can accelerate a monopole up to 2 TV. So we could have we could have universes with our own LHC, so to speak, but they'd have to be colliding magnetic monopoles, of course. Now, the monopole mass was not really predicted within Dirac's theory, and there are so many different forms of monopole from various uh, theoretical scenarios that we regard it to be a free parameter. Of course, we can look for monopoles in the cosmos. Uh, the ones we would look for are these big gut monopoles that I just talked about, gums, in other words. If you believe in extra dimensions, you can have Calusa Kali monopoles, which are even heavier. Instead of 10 to the 17 GV, they're 10 to the 19 GV. And if you, uh, in some theoretical scenarios, monopoles can be produced at later phase transitions, and they have much smaller mass, about 10 to the 9 GV. So we can look for those in the cosmos. In fact, monopoles are accelerated in these cosmic B fields. Uh, that should be field, not filed, but anyway. So B field in a spiral galaxy of the order of 10 microgauss, and as the monopole moves through it, it's, it gets accelerated along the field lines, and it can actually reach the kind of energies you expect uh, from the, the, the highest energy cosmic rays reach, around about 10 to the 20 eV by being accelerated uh, in these, uh, along these field lines. In neutron stars, it can reach even higher. In AGNs, it can reach even higher energies. Of course, people have looked uh, in these major, uh, have made major cosmic ray searches. This is Ice Cube, where we look for this increased ionization and increased Cherenkov production in uh, the Ice Cube array. There's an experiment called uh, in Grand Sasso. This shouldn't be Ice Cube. Of course, that should be macro. Apologies. Macro that was specifically designed to look for monopoles underground, and then the experiment I was on, Slim Chakotai, we were looking for those intermediate mass monopoles, so we had to be high because they'd be absorbed by the atmosphere, and of course we have Super K where you could look for Cherenkov, the increased Cherenkov production uh, uh, that we would get in a, in a large under, under, underground water detector. Nothing is seen so far, so one would say perhaps there's no monopole, but One other way we can detect monopoles is by, is by looking at monopoles as they, as they move through a coil, through this superconducting coil. So as a monopole goes through the superconducting coil, sorry, that movie doesn't want to work, but we're, I know the other one does. We'll see that later. As it moves through the superconducting coil, whenever I put a magnet through a superconducting coil, I get a current. As it's superconducting, that current persists. So there's, a, there's nothing, there's a sudden jump, and then there's a current, and it continues. And that, God, that magnetic flux is exactly twice the flux quantum of superconductivity. So it's a definite amount of current you would look for. So a lot of people start in the, I think the early 80s, started to look for, and late 90s, started to look for monopoles by putting out superconducting coils and seeing if they saw any sudden uh, jumps in the current that was being measured. And not much happened until uh, Cabrera on St. Valentine's Day in 1982 with a 20-centimeter square uh, coil saw this jump 
zap up there, and then the current continuing. This is exactly the amount you would expect for a monopole traversing the coil. That's, there was no other explanation there. This is uh, a nitrogen change. They tried every way they could to get this to jump up and stay up. There was no other way. This, the only solution could be that this was some sort of magnetic, this could be, a, well, the only thing you could think of is a magnetic monopole. There was some discussion it could be some trapped flux quanta, right? Uh, so that could still be a possibility. But again, when people look for these things, they didn't see any background as well as any signal. So if it were a trapped flux quanta, when you made your detectors 10 times bigger, you expect 10 times more trapped flux quanta to come out naively. Nothing much happened because that was the only event seen. And then uh, until 1985, the Imperial College group saw the same thing. It's not such a nice, uh, clean experimental signal, but they saw uh, a jump by exactly the amount that you would expect uh, if there are monopole traversing the coil. Here the area is 0.18 meters squared. It's a much bigger area. So there are two, two events that completely consistent with being a magnetic monopole. And, uh, and that's where we left it. But presumably there's some sort of background, some trap flux quanta or so on. But all the other experiments that, were designed, that w went into play to look for monopoles uh, didn't see anything. So why, if, there, if, it, if flat, trap flux quanta were a background, then you would expect that to come out in the other detectors. Anyway, that's interesting. There was one more event in 75 researchers in Berkeley and the University of Houston uh, flew a balloon. They were studying cosmic ray interactions in stacks of emulsions and plastic track etch detectors, very similar to the ones we're going to be using in, uh, in modal, or metal, I should say. And they flew it to high altitude, about 130,000 feet over Sioux City, Iowa. And lo and behold, they saw this incredible event. Now, the initial claims were it was a magnetic monopole. And of course, uh, you can imagine uh, this looks pretty amazing. It's a pretty high energy, highly ionizing event. And in fact, there was some article in Time on this in 1975 because it excited a lot of interest. The characteristics of the monopole event said the researchers strongly favor the identification of the particle as a magnetic monopole with a charge of 137 and a mass greater than 200 times that of the proton, traveling at a velocity half the speed of light. Now, the trouble is that they were set on by Alvarez, who was pushing the idea of anti-matter and anti-nuclei. So he wanted it to be an anti-nucleus. And he didn't like it, the, 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 he didn't like the monopole candidate. In fact, he came up with a, uh, a conventional explanation that it was a platinum nucleus fragmenting to osmium and then to tantalum. But the monopole hypothesis fits better. But of course, using Occam's razor, you shouldn't multiply hypotheses, therefore, if we can find a, a standard hypothesis, we should use it. Anyway, there we are. So there are three interesting events. There are many more sort of interesting hints, but uh, let's leave it there just to give you the little taste of some possible evidence if you choose to believe. So let's look at the physics of modal. And of course, the aim of the experiment is to look for highly ionizing particles that are avatars of new physics. And another way we can get high ionization, as most experimentalists know, is that we can, besides having this high magnetic charge, we can, we can have an ordinary magnetic charge, but something moving very slowly. Because in the beta block formula, if this beta square gets very small, then the ionization gets very, very large. So there's a whole other class of particles we can look for. These are multiple or singly electrically charged particles that are expected to be very massive and traveling very slowly through the LHC detector. So we're open to all of those, detect those kind of particles as well. In fact, the threshold for our detectors at the in, in metal is if you take the Z and divide it by beta, we can detect any particle with a Z upon beta of 5. So if the Z is just 1, we only have to have beta of 0.2, and we get this 5. So if it's slowly, slowly moving, we can detect it. So we're open to a whole class of physics that really is difficult for the LHC ordinary LHC detectors to detect. So here we have a little summary of the modal physics program. So on this side, we have a whole host of magnetically charged particles. 
And on this side, we have very slow-moving electrically charged particles, black hole remnants, cubals, R hadrons, SUSY massive particles, quirks, long-lived uh, Higgs, doubly charged Higgs, and uh, left-right symmetric models. Even some people thinking now that Higgs decay to, to two uh, a nucleus, anti-nucleus pair, mirror fermions, technibaryons, the list goes on. Um, and we can search for multiply charged particles with zeta upon beta greater than or equal to 5 and mass up to 70 EV where the charge is as high as 400. So we, uh, we've got a big range and as I said, we tend to be complementary to the, to the LHC experiments. So how do, we detect, how do we guess that they could be produced at colliders? Well, via a drill yang mechanism. Here we have production uh, Again, this is a bit faint here. This is, I think it's a projector. Some projectors you can see very clearly, some you can't. Here we have Drelian production of just a lepton pair, and we see likewise Drelian lepton production, Drelian production, I say, of a monopole pair. We can have photon, photon production of a monopole pair, and we can even have virtual production of a monopole pair by, by this uh, monopole box here where the monopole this final state, if you use virtual finals, initial state, um, intermediate state, decays to two, two photons. So if you take this one, uh, if you allow this one, then, then the monopole masses have been excluded by this up to about seven or 800 GeV upon C squared. But this, this is a problem because of the coupling constant, of this massive coupling constant at each of these vertices it's so big that you can't really do a perturbative calculation. So there's a lot of argument about this, this calculation. Meanwhile, we'll just look for the standard uh, direct production of monopoles. And in fact, something like 30, or 30 to 35 searches have been done in the past. Uh, and at the, typically at every new energy threshold, we search for magnetic monopoles. And we see this list here. Uh, obviously, we're not going to go through the list just to point out that of these searches, 30, uh, 14 of the 31 searches I list here have been carried out using these plastic nuclear track detectors that Modal uses. Three were using emulsions, and three using uh, these induction, magnetic induction. And 11 were using counters. So we're going to be, we are actually using this plastic technique because it's the, the best technique for doing the job, and it can also be used to detect these massive electrically charged particles. So let's look at the modal experiment and the detector. So here in the CERN Courier announcement on May 5th, 10th, the modal becomes LHC's magnificent seventh experiment. Here we see the, uh, the modal TDR. And it's an array of passive nuclear track edge detectors. But we've also added something. We add trapping detectors. So around the, the, uh, the collision point, we have pure aluminium detectors that trap the highly ionizing particles as well. So we can also take them away and search in squids for the presence of the magnetic charge. So we have two ways of detecting magnetic monopoles and actually any massive stable particle because they get trapped in these trapping detectors and we remove them on a regular basis and inspect them for the presence of trapped particles. So it's a new kind of detector if you want. In addition, we have a Medipix if, for the traditional particle experimentalists. They'd be more happy here. We have a traditional online pixel chip uh, called the Medipix or Timepix chip that actually monitors the highly ionizing backgrounds in the, in, the region, in the region of the LHCb experiment. So here we have our collaboration. It's a bit like uh, one of the early maps of the British Empire. Uh, and we see here... Uh, Every country in red is actually a member of METAL, and the ones in yellow are, are uh, going to become me members. In fact, just recently, Korea should be in yellow, and that's going to be very soon red. So that we have about 17 or 18 institutes now from 10 countries around the world. So we're only 30, 38 physicists. We're, we're a kind of David to the Goliaths of the LHC. But... Uh, Nevertheless, if we did find something, it would be every bit as important as the, the LHC, the, the main LHC experiments results. So where are we? Just to make it really clear, we're going to zoom in now on the uh, Lake Geneva. Most, I think many people here may recognize that. As you go down through the mist, we see the Geneva Airport. 
and here we see the we see the ring suddenly appear the LHC ring 27 kilometers in circumference here we have the SPS that injects into the LHC ring and this is the LHCB intersection region right here right by the airport is actually in France as we were discussing earlier um, so let's take the lid off and uh, and have a look I wanted the guy to put some worms in here when we did uh, but, <laughs> but uh, he didn't do that so we're taking the lid off we see the counter rotating proton beams and we're going to zoom in on the LHCB intersection uh, point so we're going to take the lid off this and have a look underneath and here we see the LHCB detector. The reason it was chosen is because it has a very open intersection region just behind this thing. Just behind there you see the open intersection region. And we surround this with, these, with this array of macrofold and also trapping detectors with these array of plastic sh uh, stacks that, that detect the, the monopoles. This is an early, it's much more extensive now, so it's much, this is an early drawing. So if we see the collision of one, mon one of the proton coming one way, proton coming the other, they collide, they create a monopole-antimonopole pair. The artist didn't conserve transverse momentum, I apologize. <laughs> and then you can see this, this monopole uh, passes through these sheets of plastic, leaving a, a characteristic damage trail that we can, uh, we can bring out with etching. And I will talk about that in a little bit. So let's have a look at the detector itself. Here we have the LHCB detector. This is the, the intersection region of the LHCB detector, and we'll go in the front door here. Uh, again, the resolution's a bit poor on this projector, but we see the whole thing is panelled with these, with these detectors, with these tr plastic track etch detectors. We also have here just the prototype trapping wall. There'll be a lot more of these blocks of aluminium there to trap uh, the particles as they come out. So in fact, there are four, four detector subsystems the massive, uh, the, all these nuclear track detectors. Then there's some very high charge catching detectors that are actually on the on the metal detect on the, here the in yellow. They're very, they've just they got a very high threshold. They're the very high charge catcher uh, array. Then we have the monopole trapping detectors I just pointed out. We also have the time fixed radiation background monitors. I think it's the first time trapping detectors trapping detectors have ever been deployed as an exact detector and then removed and replaced and removed and replaced. Most people just take old bits of beam pipe and look, but we're actually deploying them in. So there we have the first part of the array of the trapping array that's uh, there to trap any massive stable particle, electrically charged or magnetically charged. So how does it work, this tr nuclear track edge detectors? Here we see a monopole going through the plastic and breaking the long strand uh, chain molecules of the plastic. It damages the plastic as it goes through there. So it leaves a cylindrical trail of damage as the monopole goes through. Let's just go through in case you missed that. Let's back up and just do that again. You'll see coming in from here the monopole going through, breaking the plastic strands. It, it does a lot more damage than that actually and leaving this weakness in the plastic. Now this weakness is brought out by etching, we get into this later, but why do we want to use these nuclear track detectors? Because they don't need extensive support structures, they don't need high voltage, gas, electronic readout, or a trigger, which is good because we don't care how slow it is. If a particle is very slow in the LHC, it's going to cause a problem because it will cross many trigger boundaries, but here we don't care. And we're insensitive to relativistic standard model particles. There is no known background to a signal we see in this nuclear track detector array. Now, we, another advantage is we can actually go and take it to a heavy ion beam. Here we see the NASA Space Radiation Laboratory where we can expose it to heavy iron, iron nuclei, about one GeV per nucleon, that give exactly the right conditions at the right speeds, give exactly the same ionization as a, a magnetic monopole. So we can actually calibrate the detectors in place. We can't do that with the LHC detectors. So here we show the etching process. So we, we take our arrays. We have about 400 of these stacks around the LHCB intersection region. We then t put them in the etchant, which is typically hot sodium hydroxide. And as the etches, the, the sodium hydroxide etches along the damage part from each side of the plastic. So it etches from that side and from this side and creates a hole. 
on in the plastic. So only a very small hole, about 10 microns across. And then we pull the plastic out of the uh, etchant. We see this array of, should we say, 10 holes, or if we don't make it a hole, it would be 20 etch pits. That has no background. If we see that, we know we've seen uh, something interesting. And of course, we have to, uh, we have to inspect and, and look at the, the, the way the damage is done and the size of the etch pits, but we can actually tell if it's a monopole or electrically charged particle. We can tell the charge of the monopole. So we'll also deploy the tracking detectors, and then now I hope this, uh, this one will work. So what we do is we take the, the trapped monopoles, when they go through the squid, here we have the, ET, the Southampton squid, but it's very similar to the ETH Zurich squid, we see that a current is, uh, persisting current is set up. So what we do is when we take the trapping detectors out, we, they are actually in little pieces so they can be easily fed into the squid. So they can be chugged through the, the squid very, very quickly. And we look for the presence of this jump in the magnetic charge, in the, in the, in the current, because of the presence of the magnetic charge trapped in the little bit of aluminium that we've removed from around our uh, intersection point. And then once we've done that, we can take them to Snow Lab, uh, two kilometers underground, and they put them in a, an array to watch, to be watched uh, for their decays to charge particles over longer periods, like a year or so. The time picks radiation monitor is actually a very beautiful little detector if you are an experimentalist. If you even teach, it's very nice because you can actually plug this into your computer, hold a, a beta source near it, or hold an alpha source here, and you can see a di characteristic response of the, and, a, and a real picture of the event. It's like a little electronic bubble chamber. And these, uh, these devices spread around the intersection region, monitor for spallation products coming from the part, generated from the particles traversing the, the walls and traversing the plastic. Here we see one typical spallation product tracked, uh, shown almost as, as a, a little bubble chamber in the, in the in the silicon of the time picks detector was shown here. So it's really a beautiful little device. If you're an experimentalist, you'd be very excited. And here are some of the pictures we're seeing. Here's one track where we see the track uh, which has got something like 20 times minimum ionizing come in and then stop. See the Bragg peak that we s and stop in one point there. So we see this, this track uh, stopping in the silicon of the time picks detector. And this is a highly ionizing background track. It can't give us uh, something that looks like a monopole, but a lot of these could actually fog our film. So we don't have the problem of something mimicking a monopole. We do have a problem of the fogging of the film, if you think of our nuclear track detectors as a kind of film. And here we see another blob. Instead of a track, we have a blob, which is there's about 100 times minimum uh, energy deposited in this blob. It's about that, that deposited by 100 times minimum minimum ionizing particle. So these, we're studying these events at the moment, and it's about the first time I think anybody's been looking at event, uh, the, the muck around an intersection point with these kind of precise little bubble chamber uh, silicon devices. Whoop, that shouldn't have happened. Oh dear. I know, I like it when they say sorry. I, I, really makes me feel so much better. I have so many films on here, though. That's what is objecting to all the films I have, I think. But so, pray that it stays there. So, just like to emphasize the point here that if you compare what we can do with, with, with what Atlas and CMS can do, at the CMS modal. Modal is designed to detect these very, very highly charged particles. It's also designed to, well, because it's passive, to detect very, very slowly moving particles. In fact, we don't care how slowly moving it is. And if, because we have a very, very clear indication with no actual background that can mimic our signal, one candidate event is enough to establish a signal. Atlas, on the other hand, of course, it can do many, many more things, but it has a lot of trouble with uh, massive charge, and it also has a lot of trouble with things moving very, very slow. So now that it likes things moving relativistically, and it likes things to be neutral or uh, 
neutral in terms of photons, neutrons, uh, and so on, but it likes things to be moving, it likes things that are singly charged if they are charged. And typically we need a large statistical sample to establish the signal. So the two in, when you consider it as a whole, the metal detector is complementary to the LHC experiments. And it's one of the reasons that we got approved so quickly. Uh, yeah? Um, metal, you know, that should be Z upon beta. Yeah, sorry. That, oh. that got dropped. The Z, the Z, that should be... So that's your question. That should be Z upon beta. So if I look at a paper that compares us with, uh, with the other... The other detectors here, we have cross-section that we can, we can go down to. This is femtobarns. This is magnetic charge. This is, again, femtobarns. And this is electric charge. We can see that the metal detector can actually plumb the depths, uh, which it should be able to, because we're actually designed to do this, where you, Atlas CMS and LHCBD can do a reasonably good job, and so could Alice, because they, they really weren't designed to look for these things in the first place. But they, have, they definitely have an overlap with us which is good because if we do see anything, we would obviously want to look in these other detectors in much more detail. They would characterize the, uh, uh, the signal we would look for. So if we compare them up here, if we look at the energy threshold, ours is low compared to the others. The others. Alice has a very low one. That's actually very nice. It's there. Uh, one of their detectors has a very low threshold. The angular coverage is full, unlike the other ones. The luminosity is medium. The luminosity is down a bit at the LHCB intersection region. Uh, uh, not high, but we make up for that because we only need to see one event uh, opposed to many events. Robust against timing. Yes, we're robust against timing. And we're robust against efficiency. In other words, we can calibrate and we know exactly what we're looking at when we see it. We don't just... We, in the other experiments, they just say, oh, yeah, something really ionizing happened. Highly ionizing happened, but we can actually tell you exactly how ion highly ionizing it was. Yeah? It, it just, this is the actually taken straight out of the paper, so it's not my phraseology. But what it means is we don't care about timing. It, we're not sensitive to timing, whereas the other detectors are because obviously they're, uh, except for the ALICE detector, they're ordinary conventional LHC detectors. Okay, so we're getting there. Modal time scale, first detectors were, we deployed in November 2009 before we were approved, so that was a good sign that they allowed us to do that. Deployed a larger area of plastic, 80, meter, 80 square meters in Jan 2011. These are test detectors, so we can test everything out. We then made a test de deployment of the time mix detectors. Here we see these little uh, time mix chips on the walls of the cabin in February 2012. And then in September 2012, we put in some of the trapping detectors. The, the aluminium volumes are placed in these uh, aluminium housings. The full deployment is planned for the year, long shutdown starting in 2013. And in 2014-15, we expect to have our first official run uh, up to uh, integrated luminosity of 10 inverse femtobars. Last words. Not too bad. So let's say a few words about the existence of the monopole. We've already talked about some possible evidence. Well, Dirac, who is, shall we say, the father of the, the, the modern monopole, the quantum mechanical monopole, said that he, he would, said he would be surprised if nature had made no use of it, it being the magnetic monopole. Ed Witten here once asserted in his Loeb lecture that almost all theoretical physicists believe in the existence of magnetic monopoles, or at least hope there is one. That's what he said. I don't know if they would agree with him. But uh, I like the Polchinski uh, conjecture, which is, a kind of, I think, kind of intriguing. You remember from the s first slides we showed that, well, Dirac showed that the existence of at least one magnetic monopole would exchange charge quantization. And Polchinski, who's one of the, I think it's fair to say, is one of the world's leading string theorists, says that he turns it round. He said, OK, any theory requiring charge quantization, which is any, any good theory, because we know we have charge quantization, must have a monopole. You just turn the argument around. And he also maintains in a fully unified theory for every gauge field there exists one electric and magnetic sources. Well, that's a bit more obtuse uh, to, to understand if you're not a theoretician, but this one is a simple sort of reversal of that argument. And in fact, he was nice enough to write us a very strong recommendation 
and, uh, and I'd like to just say this, read it out. I'd like to express my strong support for the modal experiment. Although monopole is too, and I put in by Ed Witten to give it even more credibility, uh, do not get as much press as dark energy and other hot topics. In fact, they are the most certain prediction monopoles of a theory beyond the standard model. More so than supersymmetry, strings, extra dimensions, modified gravity, or many other widely discussed ideas. As I've discussed in my Dirac centenary talk, I think you got the Dirac medal, which I think is a theoretician's Nobel Prize. I mean, another sort of theoretician's Nobel Prize. Their existence seems inevitable in any framework that explains the quantization of electric charge, which is the argument I was just telling you about. Of course, their mass scale and abundance are highly uncertain. That's true. But the same can be said for almost any other form of new physics. So we like him for that. And the final slide here, yeah, this, is, this is DC Comics, right, to answer that question. So have you the nerve to face the unexpected? We, it, we think it's important to maximize the LHC, LHC sensitivity to new physics because we don't really know where it's coming from. The Higgs, of course, has been a different case. We were expecting the Higgs. Everybody was, knew that it must be there if you believed in the standard model. It's got to be there. But we're hoping something unexpected comes. And if you look at discoveries, they're usually unexpected. Higgs is the standout and the top. They were very expected within the framework of the standard model. And I'd like to end with the words of that famous uh, evolutionary geneticist and uh, rascal of physics, J.B.S. Haldane, who said the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but it is queerer than we can suppose. Thank you.